So I want to welcome everyone. My name is Crystal Selke. I am a program director at the University Career Center. And this event is part of a series of panels that we offer to help students learn about new career fields. And so today we're going to be talking about child services. And we're so excited to have three amazing professionals um, and professionals in training with us. Before I get to introducing them, I wanted to share with you what the format will be. Um, so you will have access to um, see us. You have a chat, I know a Q&A box that you can enter your questions in throughout the panel. Don't wait until the end. Go ahead and add them in when you have um, a thought and a question that you'd like to ask. I have some questions prepared. Um, and they will deal with asking the professionals what they're doing, where they're working, how they got, how they got there, and the, any advice they have for pursuing a career um, in their area, as well as application tips um, or potentially um, opportunities for openings. I, I also have with me today uh, Michelle Sloan. She will be kind of monitoring the Q&A box, so you may hear her pop in and share some of your questions. And I also want to thank um, RHU and the Department of Psychology. They've um, co-hosted this event with us and helped with the advertising. Um, so welcome to our panelists. Um, uh, and and not, I know I was going to say your name wrong. I still didn't say it right. Okay, we'll get to it in a minute. But I want to acknowledge my our, our panelists and um, did want to have one note that Laura was not able to make it today. She had an emergency. Um, she did share her contact information with us. So if you are wanting to talk to that certified child loss specialist, stick around to the end and you will get her email address. Um, and she's very passionate about talking with students and sharing her area of expertise. So um, she's looking forward to some emails. Okay, really quickly before we jump into this, I wanted to share a little bit about what the University Career Center offers. Um, like I said, we have um, different events like this throughout the semester that connects you with our alumni and with employers. And especially, uh, I wanted to mention Intern for a Day. That's where you can kind of shadow or do a virtual informational interview with um, area and countrywide employers. And it's really good for freshmen, sophomore, juniors who are exploring different areas um, that their careers may go into. And so the last day to sign up for that intern for a day is going to be um, Friday. So check it out on careers.umd.edu and you can find out more about that as well as the other events um, featured at the bottom of your screen. And I know you're all familiar with Careers for Turks because that's how you register for this event. Thank you for doing that. But um, the next time you're in there, please check out. There's tons of jobs and internship openings, especially th um, things that are related to working with children or with youth-based programs. You may also schedule individual appointments with um, career advising staff. And there's also several different uh, resources in there for you to explore careers with. So welcome to our panelists. Um, what I'm going to do now is invite each of our panelists to give a short overview and introduction of um, themselves and what they're doing right now. And I'd like to start with um, Krista Marsico. Could you please share with us a little bit about your current position and um, how you got there? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Marsico, and I'm a school psychologist intern for Howard County Public Schools. And what that means is that I'm wrapping up my graduate degree, so I'm getting a PhD in school psychology from the University of Maryland. And the last component of that is over 1,700 hours of supervised school psychology work. So in Howard County Public Schools, I'm working in an elementary school and a high school doing things like special ed evaluations, individual and group counseling, um, behavioral and academic interventions, and then I also do consultation with teachers and families. Um, so right now it's all virtual. It's an interesting start to the school year, but I'm really enjoying it. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about how I got here, but basically I didn't even know what a school psychologist was until my sophomore year of college. 
Um, and then I did a lot of shadowing and decided, um, did I want to pursue a master's degree or a PhD and ultimately decided to pursue the PhD? Should I become a certified school psychologist, but also a licensed clinical psychologist? Um, and so I did a lot of research and a lot of work hands-on with kids in undergrad. And then I came right into my PhD after graduating from the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you. And thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Um, Richard Reese, who are you and what do you do? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Richard Reese. I am a regional recruitment manager for City Year. Um, I went to Indiana University for, uh, I guess, five years. Um, but during my time at IU, I wanted to take a break. I was feeling a little depressed, down, not understanding like what I was going to do after college. And so I did city year in San Antonio for two years in between my college experience. And then after my second year, I went back to IU to finish my undergrad degree um, with a bachelor's in, um, who, what was it in? I forgot, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yes, I finished my degree. I now came back to city year. And so for the past seven years, I've been serving and working alongside amazing recruiters trying to get more AmeriCorps members to serve in our schools in our 29 cities. Uh, and I look forward to sharing more about that experience and what city is in this uh, panel. Thank you, Richard. And quickly, can you explain what city year is? Yeah, so city year, so we are an educational nonprofit. Uh, we hire AmeriCorps members for all 29 of our current city year locations. And our AmeriCorps members serve in the classroom uh, with full-time teachers and they're, and they're supporting and helping our students get back on track and stay on track with their education. And we focus in two main areas, English and math. Uh, and so our core members will create either one-on-one -on -one or small group uh, for our students. And of course, now that it's virtual, um, the students have more one-on-one -on -one connection with our core members because the teachers create breakout sessions for our students in the core members so they can continue to do that one-on-one -on -one support. Um, and then our core members are also uh, considered like role models in the classroom and in the school building. And so they figure out how they can continue to work with the students outside of the classroom during like their day walking to class and checking in on them and figuring out like what ways we can better um, attend to the needs of the students. Um, and so that's pretty much what City Air is. Perfect, thank you. And then our last panelist, Anaya Henley. Ania. Ania. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you for being here. Please excuse me. <laughs> no problem. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I currently um, attend the University of Maryland as an English um, language and literature major. Um, I'll be graduating this semester, so I'm super excited about that. Um, I, my former role as a youth development coordinator kind of got absorbed after COVID-19. But um, I really want to share some of like the cool things that I did um, with this um, company, Columbus Property Management. Um, I honestly didn't know that I could work in property management as well as with the children. So it was really um, interesting to kind of fall into this role, but it was definitely fulfilling. Um, previous to this role, I was a preschool teacher, which I really enjoyed. And I worked in um, Alexandria, Virginia with Kitty Academy. Um, and then before that, I was a youth enrichment leader um, in DC with a community center. And while doing that, I did the AVID program for um, Prince George's uh, County Public Schools. But I just wanna share some of the cool things that I did. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. We'll stick with you. I'm gonna take the slideshow down now. And would you share with us a little bit um, from one of the positions, kind of what was your day-to-day -day like? Um, so with my uh, last position uh, at Columbus Property Management, um, I ran programs for low-income children. So um, I had a robotics program, I had a, um, which was STEM-based, um, but it was actually STEAM-based, so we incorporated like art with like engineering, science, uh, math, different things like that. Um, we also had a Georgetown reading program. 
So we partnered with Georgetown and students would come over from um, Georgetown University and kind of work with the students and tutor them in reading and writing. So that was really fun and the kids really enjoyed it, you know, having like a younger person um, kind of work with them and um, help them enhance their reading and writing skills. Uh, we also had a homework club every week. So the children kind of had one-on-one -on -one help with their homework, um, which was awesome. So yeah, kind of like my day-to-day. -day. Excellent. Let's stay with this question. Um, Richard or Kristen, feel free to jump in. What is your day-to-day -day like? Or for Richard, potentially what would an AmeriCorps uh, recruit day be like in the school? Sure, I can jump in here. Um, so one of the things that really drew me to the field of school psychology is that every day is so different and unpredictable. And I really like the opportunity to start every day kind of as a blank slate um, and figure out what the needs of the students and the schools are. Um, so just as an example, this week, um, although it's all virtual, I've done um, several individual counseling sessions. I've attended multiple IEP meetings for students who either already have special ed services or are qualifying for them. Um, and that means in the next few weeks, I'm also gonna start some assessments, um, some virtual, and hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll get into some face-to-face -face assessments, things like cognitive assessments. Um, and I'll send rating scales to parents and teachers to better understand students' functioning. Um, but this week, I also, I had the unfortunate opportunity um, to do a suicide intervention procedure with a fifth grader who made a concerning comment. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that in the virtual environment, a lot of emerging mental health concerns. And so in my role, I um, respond to those concerns and assess the level of risk, um, and then also kind of help connect students to ongoing mental health support, whether it's in the community or in the school. Um, so, Every week is very different and a lot of it just depends on the needs of the students that week. If there's a crisis, um, I've already responded to two crises in the county. Um, so it's really very dependent on what's going on in any given day. And that's what I really like about the role. So for an AmeriCorps member, um, it is a one year commitment. Um, and the typical day can start at around 7, 7.30 a.m. and it ends around 5 o'clock or 5, uh, 6 p.m. And it just really depends on the site that you apply to and your school team, because uh, each AmeriCorps member will be on a school team around 10 to 12 people, and then each person will be in their own classroom. And then during that time, like I mentioned, you would either do one-on-one -on -one support with your students or small group support. Uh, one of my favorite things uh, about my experience was being able to connect with the students outside of academics and really just talk to them as human beings and as little people. And just really figure out like, how can I best support them in um, the things that are going on outside of the, the school environment. And I think that's why I decided to come back for a second year. Uh, and that second year, I was helping the first year Merrick members through their process. And so I was doing a lot of coaching and observation and also helping with our training and training our AmeriCorps members so they can see the different signs that students may be carrying into, this, into the school and how we can best support them. And if we can't support them, how can we find uh, people within the school building that can actually support them? And if they need to make like a home visit, what ways can City Year help that? And one way that we did during my core experience, we created these things called early warning indicators. So EWI meetings with the um, support staff at the school and the principal and teachers. And we were able to highlight different things that we were seeing um, that our student behaviors that they're bringing into the school and how we can best uh, give them the resources they need during their day. Um, and then another one thing that I liked about my experience. Um, so I served at a high school and of course, for some reason, the in-school suspension, ISS, typically is filled with uh, students. And we decided to uh, continue to tutor and help our students who are in ISS. And so during our break periods, we would go to ISS and help our students and figure out what assignments they need and how they can continue to stay on top and on task with the rest of their classmates. And I think that was the one thing that really helped my experience because we were a two-year um we were like a new partnership and we really want to figure out how can we support our students academically but then also uh, with their social emotional learning skills and uh, i think that was my my personal favorite part of my experience so 
So one quick follow-up, uh, Richard, it sounds like you're in the school, but you have the capacity to really make an impact. And it just depends on what class and what the needs are. And so you're working kind of with a group. Is that right? Yes. So uh, the group of students would be around five to seven students, uh, mm -hmm. no more than seven, because we really want to be focused. Uh, we call it a focus list. And the idea is to work with those students for the entire year. And each core member will, at the end of the year, have around 14 to 16 hours of intervention or tutoring time with their students, either during the day or after school tutoring. Um, and that's why our days are kind of long, uh, because during after school, you either have special programs for your students or um, me and my team, we really wanted to focus, since we we're in ninth grade, we really wanted to focus on tutoring uh, our students in English and math and all the rest of the uh, different classes they were taking uh, during that time. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see, two follow-up questions for Kristen came in. Can you please share what is the difference between school psychologist and guidance counselor? It's a good one. Yes, that is a great question. Um, there's a lot of differences, but the easiest way and the most simple way to kind of sum it up is that school counselors typically work with students who are receiving general education. Um, whereas school psychologists, the bulk of my work is with students who are receiving special education services. And they could be receiving those because they have something like ADHD, um, because they have a learning disability, a mental health concern like depression or anxiety. Um, so I do a lot more work with students who are in special education. Um, and then also school psychologists, because of our training, we often are responsible for data collection and research in the schools. So in Howard County Public Schools, we have student support teams and the school psychologists lead those. And the counselors are part of that team and they bring a lot of expertise and knowledge about their students. Um, but school psychologists really focus on data. Um, and so we help figure out how to implement interventions, collect data on them to decide if they're effective, decide what else students need. Um, and then the other big distinction I would say is oftentimes the students I work with as a school psychologist have much higher needs than the students the school counselors are working with. Um, so for example, I'm working with a student this year who um, last year attacked the uh, principal with scissors. So he has really high levels of behavioral needs um, and that's a student that I would be working with um, to support. Okay, and one quick follow-up question to that as well is when you talk about a child's IEP, first of all, people might not know what that means. And number two, how do you determine what plan would work best when creating an IEP? Yeah, that's a great question. I apologize. School psychology is a field of acronyms. Um, so IEP is an individualized educational plan. Um, and so these are for students who are receiving special education services. And an IEP outlines um, what classification they're receiving services under, for example, specific learning disability, um, and then all of the services, resources, and accommodations that students get, in addition to the goals that have been set for them. So that allows us to progress monitor over time how our students are doing academically, socially and emotionally, behaviorally, et cetera. Um, so each IEP, as it's called individualized, is very individual based on the students. And so we collect a lot of data. And as a school psychologist, I do very standardized assessments to figure out where the current, the student's current level of functioning is. And then we set goals to try and scaffold them up to where we'd like to see them be. Um, and so the IEP helps us put in formal services and accommodations to help them continue to make progress. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so let's ask our panelists, what past experiences did you have that prepared you for your current position? And whoever wants to jump in first, please do, do so. I can share. Um, so for me, I'm from a big family. I'm one of 13. Uh, so I've been helping my nieces and nephews since I was 12 and their early stages of development, uh, helping them to read, write, um, do math, and all the fun things. And then in high school, um, I was always at our Boys and Girls Club. And then we also had like parks, uh, parks and rec center. Uh, we'll always have like tutoring services and things like that for 
the students in my community and I've always wanted to go there to support them and help them um, with either homework or just being a friend, even though, you know, like I said, I'm from a big family. So it's always for me good to be around people. And then I ventured to IU um, and I continued to work at the Boys and Girls Club um, during the summer. Um, I was a camp counselor every summer. And the one experience that really helped me to see like that I wanted to be with City Year uh, was a camp called Camp Hope. So it's in the, uh, the DMV area. And my friend and roommate, uh, his father invited me to the camp and then it's an overnight camp. And so every year since 2012, I've been part of Camp Hope, working with the students overnight um, and really just trying to give them a different environment. So mo the majority of the students who will come to Camp Hope are students of color. And the one thing that they all have in common is they don't have a father figure in their household. And so we would try to create this environment where they can ask questions that they might not be able to ask a male in their life. And for me, it was impactful because I was just really just sharing all the different things that my father has taught me up until um, I turned 21. He passed away when I was 21. And so it was just nice to give back that way. And then for the two years that I spent with City Year, it really just helped me to like take off the hat of being like an adult and just really listening and figuring out how can I actually make this connection with this student and not think about trying to, you know, have that savior mentality. And so that's why I stayed with City Year and I love City Year is the fact that you can build that relationship uh, from the ground level with the student and then see them improve in their academics based on like that relationship that you have created with them. And then also helping them to find those different people in the school building they can also uh, trust in and believe in because they believe in them. Well said. I just want to make one point. So you um, worked as a camp counselor, right? Did you volunteer? Did you do an internship? No. So um, with City Year, um, you, as an AmeriCorps member, um, I saw one of the questions. So well, I, we I mean, just your past experience, because oh. as we talk about internships being so important, but I think you oh, make no. the point that like working as a camp counselor is amazing experience that allowed you to test out your interests and things like that. So yes, yeah, I, I, I didn't have to go through it. Yeah, internship. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I'll go. <laughs> Um, so my mother was an educator, um, so it was like a very big thing in my house. My father is um, from Trinidad and Tobago, so, you know, education was just very important growing up. And so I've always been good with kids, but I, I never actually wanted to work with kids, I, but it was always something that I was good with. And then um, after getting my uh, position with Avid, I kind of realized, like, the importance of like a mentor figure in like a children's life and um, and how impactful that is. Um, and I lost my brother when I was um, 17. So I wanted to like let children know, like although you may go through pain, like you don't have to suffer. Um, and there are people that care about you and that do have your best interests. And I just wanted to be like that figure in their life. And so after just, kind of working in the field I just kind of like grew the love for like children working with preschoolers like watching them develop watching them take their first steps like different things like that was just really cool um and then being able to direct my own camp kind of just like took me back to my own childhood when I uh, kind of went to camp in the summers and all the cool camp counselors we had and different things like that growing up it like really inspired me to kind of just make their summer fun, give them exposure. Like our kids got to um, go to American University for the first time, like to see a college and they got to swim and they got to kind of take swimming lessons that summer. Um, they, we also had our camp um, kind of do healthy eating. Um, I don't think people really understand like the importance of like healthy eating. Um, from the time you're a child because it alleviates, you know, diabetes and other like chronic illnesses. So we kind of implemented that into the camp. Um, we, we, we worked on grants, um, being able to receive grants to, you know, impact low-income kids. 
uh, working on getting food. Um, I actually have a Serve Safe Manager certificate, so I definitely um, was able to kind of see how like foodborne illnesses can um, can happen with food. So like it's really it's it's like a lot involved with like working with children, and um, yeah, it's really awesome to kind of have that experience. Yeah, and I can share. So to be completely honest with y'all, I had no idea what I wanted to do after graduation. And so I used especially summers in between my years in college to kind of try out different interests. Um, so I thought that I might be interested in being a teacher. Um, and so I volunteered at an after school program. Um, and I liked that, but it was kind of too big of a group for me. Um, and I was also a camp counselor with a smaller group. And so that's how I started realizing that I enjoyed working more with small groups of kids or one-on-one -on -one with students. Um, and so my junior year of college, I met someone who was a school psychologist and they told me about an internship at a school uh, for kids who had significant emotional disabilities. So these are kids who throw chairs, curse out their teachers, get in daily fights, um, really have significant issues self-regulating. Um, and so my senior year of college, I interned there 20 hours a week. So it was a pretty big commitment. Um, but I really got to figure out what I was passionate about. Um, and because my supervisor was a school psychologist, I got to see a lot of the kind of ins and outs of his role, even though I was more focused on being in the classroom with the students and supporting them, especially during crisis situations. Um, so that internship was really formative for me. Um, and I'll also just add that around my junior year at the very beginning, I started thinking that I might want to go to grad school. I wasn't entirely sure if it would be something, I thought maybe at one point clinical psychology. Um, I threw around a lot of ideas, um, but I knew research might be a really good way to kind of boost my resume. And so my junior and senior year, I participated in a research lab at the University of Pittsburgh. So those research skills definitely helped me figure out other ways that I'm passionate about serving kids um, and was very helpful when I decided to apply for a PhD program. Let's stick with Kristen because there's a couple other questions about um, like certification and like PhD versus master's. Um, can you share with us a little bit more about your educational background? Sure. Um, so it's kind of confusing in the field of school psychology because school psychologists can have that role and have that title with what's called a specialist degree. Um, so it's a little confusing because there's not a title differentiation when you have a master's or specialist versus a PhD. Um, but to kind of simplify the differences, um, the master's degree is a three-year program. So two years on campus and then a full-time internship like what I'm doing. Um, and after that, you pretty much have set your path to work in school. So it could be anywhere you're certified to work K or birth through 21. So some people work with infants and toddlers, some people work in K through 12. Um, but then for those of you who are interested in things like psychology, the American Psychological Association has three tracks of psychology. So clinical counseling and school psychology. Um, so with a PhD in school psychology, it's a five year program. And afterwards, I will be a certified school psychologist and I can work in schools, um, but I can also continue to get more supervised hours and then sit for another exam. Um, and that would allow me to become a licensed psychologist. So that's the same certification someone with a counseling or clinical psych degree would have. And that really opens the doors for me to do things like work in hospitals, uh, clinics, I can open a private practice and do um, private assessment or therapy. So I decided to pursue the PhD because A, I was really interested and passionate about research and a PhD includes at least one intensive research project. Um, but it also kind of opened more doors for me, and I thought I might be able to make more of an impact in different settings with a PhD. Richard, can you share what are the requirements for students interested in AmeriCorps? Is it full-time jobs? Are there internship opportunities? Yes, um, so I can only share about city year. Um, but we do partner with AmeriCorps uh, and they have several different opportunities on their website. But for city year, it is a one year commitment. Um, and like I mentioned, so you select a city 
that you'll be serving in. And in that city, you will have around either 50 AmeriCorps members or 300 AmeriCorps members, depending on your city or location. Um, and then the only, we have two real requirements, one age. Uh, so you have to be in the age range of 18 to 25 to serve as an AmeriCorps member and then a US citizen. Uh, we accept all majors um, because we really understand that not everyone wants to become a teacher and you can find what you want to do during like your core year based on your um, network that you will build in that city, your location. So if you are thinking about uh, becoming a teacher, of course, you'd be there with the full time teacher. Um, if you think about becoming a school psychologist, uh, they have them at the schools and our core members who are thinking about going to grad school will typically um, reach out to them in the school and hear like their experience, different things like that. And then during the year, you also have professional development training. And during that training, that's when we really dive deeper into like, what do you want to do after your city year experience? Uh, because once again, we understand it's a one year commitment. And during the January to March, January to April, we're really focusing on like, how can we better position you with those soft skills you may want to grow in during your core year so you can show that on your resume and in the interview. Um, and yeah, so the, like I mentioned, so the only real requirements is uh, being 18 to 25 and being a U.S. citizen because of the, we are partnership with AmeriCorps. And that can go over the benefits later and all that stuff. Excellent. And Nia, could you please share with us why you chose your major in English, correct? And, and how do you see that helping you in the future? Um, so much like Kristen, I wanted to go into research when I initially picked my, um, my major. But after finding my love and passion for children, I now want to be a teacher. Um, so that's my, that's my third of study. Um, I'm actually in the process of working with Teach for America. So I'm like going through the whole process right now of getting into that program, actually. Excellent, congratulations. Um, the next question is, do you have any advice for students? So some of you are still in school, others have been out so long they have forgotten what they majored in. If you could, <laughs> if you could talk to your uh, freshman or sophomore self, what, what advice would you share with our students? Um, I would definitely say um, get an internship, like get out there and like kind of build your resume while you're still in school so that when you do get out of school, you you may have to start entry level, but you can kind of move up pretty quickly if you um, kind of have like a little bit more experience. Um, but yeah, I definitely think internships, volunteer work, um, definitely get a mentor. A mentor is like really important because they can open doors for you as well and they might know somebody that knows somebody that can kind of direct you in whatever you know direction you want to take your career path yeah so yeah just one follow-up question in terms of getting an internship um was there particular sources that were helpful for you when you went through um to network with people that kind of thing so my first internship in college was with the Department of Energy um, as an intern for the Office of Human Resources. Um, so that was fun. Um, I really didn't know that human resources uh, did awards and all these other different things. Um, it was really fun. Um, we got to go on field trips to like the Capitol, um, the Pentagon. Um, it was really informative. We learned a lot. We got to get a lot of exposure. Um, I got the opportunity to work with um, senior executives uh, in a um, organization like Improvement Initiative. So that was really cool. But um, I definitely think just being able to go on like USA Jobs and sometimes the university might offer certain, you know, government positions as well as other positions where you can like find internships. I know with RU, we get like messages every so often about different internships that are, you know, that we can access. And so just being like able to um, kind of look through that stuff and find what 
what your niche or whatever your interest might be. Yeah, and Nia made a lot of really good points, especially about finding a mentor um, and doing a lot of different activities to try out your interests. Um, the biggest thing I would say is really, whether you have no idea what you want to do or you're pretty set on a career, is try it out and talk to a lot of people who are in that role. Um, one thing I figured out really quickly is that oftentimes the same job title looks very different at a different company and a different city and a different state. Um, and so, for example, I talked to one person who was a school psychologist and she was like, this is the worst job ever. You don't want to do this. And if I would have just taken that at face value, I wouldn't be here today. And I am so passionate about what I do. Um, I also did a lot of shadowing, um, especially as a freshman and sophomore, trying to figure out what I want to do. And that's why I think intern for a day is so great because it's a very brief opportunity to just try something out. I thought I might want to be a speech language pathologist and then I shadowed one for a day and I was like, oh, this is a cool field, but it's not my field. Um, and so that's something that would be really hard to know just from kind of Googling look, career paths or looking at things like that. So I definitely recommend using resources like all the great events. It's great that you guys came to a panel like this um, and using connections like Terrapins Connect um, to connect to people who are in the field to see what it's really like for those who are out doing what you might be interested in. And I guess the last thing that I would say is um, really find what you're passionate about and use that excitement to find the job that you really want to do. I know a lot of my, unfortunately, my mom and dad passed away when I was in, like I said, my mom passed away when I was in high school and then my father passed away when I was <clears throat> in college. And so I didn't have that, um, like, them talking to me in my ear, like, what are you gonna do after college? Is this job gonna make a lot of money? What it, where are you gonna live after college? And all these different things. And so I just like to tell people just to really find that thing that you wanna do and do it and figure out like, um, the panelists keep saying like, who can direct you in the right path and who can serve as that mentor? I've had the same mentor since uh, my freshman year of college. His name is Dr. Sean Ray. He's a professor at UMD. Um, and he's just been like the one person in my life that's been constant since the passing of both of my parents. And so it's amazing that you can find that person and they can also give you those different directions that you could possibly go into. That's such a great point. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one specific question that I wanna make sure we get to is just a question about if I'm going to do an internship in the field of psychology, like what types of internships should I consider, I suppose? So if I'm interested in school psychology or um, school counseling, are there internships in that field or do they require kind of an advanced degree? Yeah, so I know fields like school psychology and for people who are interested in doing therapy or social work, it could be really hard as an undergrad to actually get into those fields um, because a lot of the work we do is really confidential. Um, so like the assessments I give, unless you're studying school psychology or you are a school psychologist, you can't access those materials. Um, so what I would recommend is if you're interested in a field like that or even in something like therapy and you can't do that exact thing, I would look for internships where you can use a similar skill set and gain knowledge that will be relevant. So if you're interested in school psychology, I recommend figuring out ways that you might be able to volunteer in a school, especially in a class for kids who are receiving special education services or their specialized schools and programs for kids with certain types of needs. Um, if you're interested in doing more of the therapy, there's so many opportunities to do things like working for a crisis hotline, um, where you are able to talk to people and use those sorts of helping skills, even if it's not a formal therapy type of experience. So in looking at a psychology internship, I really recommend thinking about what are the actual skills that you get to build and the duties you'll have, as well as who you'll be surrounding yourself with. Um, an internship is a great place for you to make connections and find the mentors um, that Richard and Ania have both talked about. One of my 
the last questions is um, since COVID-19 has hit the country, how has your um, position changed and do you foresee it um, having a lasting impact on youth-based programs and working with children? I can definitely answer that. Um, I was definitely affected by COVID-19. Um, our almost entire office kind of got absorbed due to COVID-19. Because we were working in a residential building where people live, um, it was kind of something that we just couldn't do anymore because of the virus. Um, so it was really unfortunate and I definitely think it's um, gonna definitely affect the children. Um, sometimes in low income families, they don't often understand the importance of education um, or don't value it at all. So I think the kids um, are definitely gonna be like kind of impacted because of this um, this situation has kind of affected them educationally and socially, um, not being able to um, get out of their, their apartment and maybe do certain things. Um, they're kind of confined to small spaces. Um, so it's kind of unfortunate. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so for our AmeriCorps members, they still work with their students and uh, with their teacher, um, but in the virtual space. But then, like I mentioned, the teacher will create a breakout session for the core members so they can still do that one-on-one -on -one or small group support for their students. Um, and tomorrow, we have our professional development training for our AmeriCorps members. So everything for us is, is uh, have stayed the same except that we are virtual. And we fortunately didn't have to cut any of our AmeriCorps member uh, positions as far as like how many core members would be in each location. So we we're able to keep that number. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that because there's this thought that everyone is not hiring and that programs are dying. So that's um, terrific. Well, will you go ahead and share with us if we want to learn more about opportunities with City Year, where's the best place to go? Yeah, so <clears throat> I am the recruiter for UMD. Uh, so I'll be the person, if you do fill out an interest form, um, we'll contact you and set up time to speak with you over the phone to see what location you are thinking about applying to, help you through the application process, help you through the interview process, and then ultimately um, check it in on you during the year of service that you, uh, that you may apply to. Um, and I will, in the chat, put my calendar link in an interest form. Uh, if you are interested, like I said, if you fill out that form, I will be contacting you. And then the calendar link will um, direct you to a calendar where it will show times that I'm free and you can sign up for any time slot that you want. That's very generous. Thank you for doing that. Um, and then one last question. So that opportunity would mostly be for current seniors, correct? Yes, so the best time to apply to city year would be the fall of your senior year. Um, and then you'll be applying for, of course, the year that you graduate from UMD. Um, and then you'll be serving from either July or August of the year that you graduate to June of the following year. Thank you. Um, Kristen, how's your world changed since COVID-19? Yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, and a lot of it depends on what school system school psychologists are working in. So a lot of the schools around here are currently all virtual and some are going back at different paces. So Howard County Public Schools does not plan to go back in person until the second semester. Um, and so that has kind of changed the entire fall and winter for me. Um, so the biggest change um, I would say is in terms of our counseling services, uh, I can't do them in person. And so that brings about a lot of challenges, especially with students who have body technology. Um, it's really hard to do group counseling and ensure confidentiality. Um, and one of the reasons I went into school psychology was because a lot of families don't have access to community-based therapy. There's a lot of barriers, um, but almost every student goes to school. And so I can help students and provide services for free 
through that avenue. Um, so it's definitely been more challenging in a virtual world because there are more barriers to, I can't just pop into someone's math class and pull them for 30 minutes and do a quick lesson on coping skills. Um, so that's been challenging. But I will say that more than ever, there are a lot of mental health needs emerging, behavioral needs, academic needs. Um, and so while you can't be a school psychologist as a current undergrad, um, schools are more and more hiring support staff and I've seen a lot of advertisements for families who are looking for college students to help their kids at home navigate the virtual world. Um, so some of that is just typically developing kids who need help getting from one Zoom to another and making sure they're on task um, all the way up to I've seen a lot of ads for kids who have significant autism or intellectual disabilities and their parents just are looking for another set of hands to help make sure that the student is accessing the curriculum to the best of their ability. So there's definitely a lot of new opportunities that are coming out of this virtual setting. So there are some pros and some cons. Well, we're coming almost to the end of the webinar, but it, so I wanna encourage any um, students listening, if you have questions, please add them now in the Q&A. Um, one of my last last questions for the panelists is when working with children or with youth-based programs, are there particular skills that would make someone more successful? I can start. Um, I think there are a few. Um, obviously, passion and interest in working with kids, it goes a really long way. Kids can tell when you're genuine and when you care about them as people. Um, and I think that's something that can't be taught. It can't be learned. Um, and so if you're interested in working with kids, that's already a great skill that you have. Um, but I also think an ability to take on new challenges, to try new things, Sometimes as the adult and as a school psychologist, I have to really go out of my comfort zone and be the silly one, the goofy one, the one who shows kids how to do something that's scary. Um, and so I think being flexible um, and being willing to try things that you wouldn't usually want to do um, is a great skill. Um, I think the one skill I think that's important to be listening. Definitely having active ears. Um, and when you are like giving them some type of direction, remembering like it's for the student and not bring it in like your past or how someone talked to you as a kid, but understanding their current situation and how you can help them to understand like what they're going through instead of bringing in your own past experiences. It's extremely hard, but <clears throat> not all students and all kids uh, have and will uh, present the same type of behaviors. And so you have to just really take a step back and understand the behaviors and then from there assess it and figure out like how you can best support them um, for who they are and not for what you think they um, are possibly going through in their life. Yeah, totally agree with what both Richard and Kristen said. Um, it takes a lot of patience as well, but I think you really do have to have a passion for children. Um, they definitely pick up on uh, people that don't have their best interests and they want someone that can they can trust. So being that figure in their life that mm -hmm. they can actually come to and kind of talk to, I think is really important because kids deal with a lot um, even in the virtual world, I think they're just dealing with a lot right now. And sometimes they just need someone that's like has their back and kind of has their, their best interest. So being that figure that they can trust is like really important. Well said. I'm going to bring up our last slide, which includes um, your contact information. But before I do that, I wanted to share one more question that came in from Maddie. And her question is, what advice do you have for graduating seniors? So one piece of advice I have is to take a deep breath. Um, my mom always told me, you don't have to pick what you're going to do for the rest of your life after graduation. You're just picking what you want to try next. 
Um, and I can even tell you one of the girls in my cohort, so she's getting a PhD in school psychology, came from City Year Miami. Um, so that was where she figured out her passion, what exactly she wanted to do. So you don't have to know exactly what you want to do the second you graduate. So give yourself grace. Spend this year thinking about the things you're interested in that you want to try out and know that you have plenty of time to try things out. And a lot of people move from one career to another. Um, I would say, remember like the, the friends and the friends that you've made uh, in, at UMD, definitely try to connect with them during this time uh, because you, you know, like, of course we're in COVID and it's just a, a good time to remember those who've been with you throughout this like journey of college from the beginning. And so connecting with them and just checking in with them, um, mental breaks are always great. And so I would say that, and then I agree with Kristen, like just really think about what you, what you really want to do. Um, it should always be about you and your passion. Of course, people will give you like what you, what they think you should do, but remember yourself at the, at the front end of it and do what's good for you and what's going to make you happy and what you're passionate about. Um, so yeah, so I, and you may need to take a gap year and city year can be there for you. Put that plug in there. <laughs> um, so my advice as a graduating senior is um, just be patient with yourself. Um, you don't have it all figured out yet. I definitely don't but um, kind of throw yourself into what you're passionate about, like Richard and Kristen said, like kind of just find what you like um, and go for it. Like the world is yours and, you know, be patient. You may not get that dream job immediately, but sometimes you have to like start from the ground up and you might have to take an entry level position that's not paying much, but it might get you, um, be the stepping stone to something bigger. So just be patient with yourself and um, just, yeah, enjoy the process. That's my advice. Excellent advice. Um, and if I can, I just wanted to offer a quick kind of wrap up. Um, so, so, so many great pieces of advice that you shared. Um, so in terms of trying out this field of working with um, children or youth and youth-based programs, we heard that camp counseling type of positions are really helpful. Internships with nonprofits potentially working with children are really helpful. Um, mentor, uh, mentoring, so finding someone working in that field that um, you can ask questions to along with that, requesting informational interviews from people working in the field. And all of this will kind of help you learn more about the field and um, have something to measure your values against. Um, the panelists were kind enough to give the University Career Center a plug for some of our programs. And um, some of those that were spoken about was Intern for a Day, which um, orientation ends for that tomorrow. So check it out on careers.umd.edu. You may also find Terrapins Connect at that same website. That is the University of Maryland's alumni and student mentoring platform where you can um, touch um, 3,000 or so alumni and ask about how they got started in their field. Basically do what we did here today, but on an individual basis. Um, and then the other thing that um, someone mentioned was really helpful in terms of finding internships and job openings was um, contacts within their department. So if you're receiving those emails from sociology, psychology, government and politics, it um, sounds like it's worth opening them up and um, our, our Hughes students too, excuse me. Um, and then in terms of what skills were important, I wanted to highlight what I heard was staying present with um, children when working with children, being, having an, an uh, innate passion for working with children, being flexible, and being patient. Um, finally, I wanted to highlight this, the last things that we heard 
was give yourself a break. This is an extremely difficult time. It's a hard time to be a senior and be graduating. Um, there are opportunities out there. Um, so if you need help, you want to talk through how to do things or you need help finding mentorship, please schedule an appointment with the University Career Center because we are here to help you um, connect with your friends and family, stay in touch with people and take care of yourself. So I will end on that note. I wanna thank our panelists so much. It's extra for you to um, add us to be a part of your day. So we really value you and appreciate you. Okay. So we'll conclude at this point and I wanna thank you everybody. Stay well and stay healthy.